Here I have some of the early attempts to create a Volander. Some of you may have seen the XM2 flying the University Airport. And the XM3 is, a, um, is a, another a, a version, a smaller version of that, two passenger, but a smaller version. And then the XM4 was one of the early ones when we put eight separate engines in to create a, uh, a complete vehicle. The problem with this kind of technology is that it, it, there's really, there's a big distance between science and technology. You can come up with something and you can say it works, and of course we know that we look at something like the television set, roughly 30 years between the time that uh, it was invented and demonstrated until it was produced by RCA uh, the studios or RCA a production company. The helicopter was invented given credit by Carnu in 1907, and it went onto the market in the first commercial form in about 1947. And uh, the, uh, I'm trying to think of the third thing is very common, certainly the, uh, the f I think the best example is the automobile. Uh, Benz, uh, Mercedes-Benz really did its first demonstration back in the late 1800s. 30 years later, Ford brought the Model T out. So there's a fairly large time span, and this is, unfortunately been our experience that even though when I was at the University of California we could establish that the technology should be possible, that the science made it possible for this to fly, there was a long distance between that and making it happen. In the late 16, 1960s, I was a tenured professor at the University of California and probably one of the most secure jobs in the world. I left that position to take on probably the least secure job in the world as an entrepreneur without any money. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but if you really want to make something happen, if you want to create something in the world that other people can use, you really have to get out in the industry and put the pieces together to make it happen. My first hurdle, of course, when I left the university. I took my retirement money with me, whatever I could find to start out uh, in the business, but I immediately had to worry about how I raised money. And that uh, was not so easy to do when you consider that what I was working with was in many people's minds science fiction. I wasn't clearly able to uh, get an interest from the venture capitalists because if you consider what I was really trying to do, I was trying to put together a machine that used Engines that weren't in existence, engines that could produce two horsepower per pound. Our science said it had to produce two horsepower per pound. There's nothing like that. Maybe turbines, but you can imagine what eight turbines would do in a vehicle like this in terms of cost. The second thing you needed was computers because a vehicle like this is not inherently stable. It has to be stabilized by electronics. So you had a, this redundant computer design and we can't even get a micro soft system to work reliably. And I'm sitting here trying to put my life on the stake with a redundant computer. That really didn't exist in those days. And finally, materials. You need some fairly exotic materials. You need, we have them today, carbon fiber, a lot of things that are out today that we didn't have then. So it took a long time to bring those various technologies together to make it possible to make the vehicle happen. So how do I raise tens of millions of dollars? Well, I'm very fortunate that I initially had the help of a number of uh, angels, as we call them. I would call angel investors. I probably would better call them visionary investors. But they came in very early with me in the late 60s, and they were still supporting me into the now, at this time, period of time. And along the road, we came close to bankruptcy many times, uh, and the wolf has been at the door even fairly recently, but fortunately things are changing. I'll tell you a little about that. But the I had to really find ways to create the kind of capital that's possible to make this happen. And that's where I ended up in a number of businesses. I can't really tell you in honest terms that I consider myself an entrepreneur with regard to this vehicle here. An entrepreneur is supposed to make money. He's supposed to go out and create something that's going to make money in a reasonable length of time. He's supposed to be able to go out and find venture capitalists that can support him so he can make money in a reasonable length of time. Well, clearly this is not the case. 
I did have to become an entrepreneur because I had to raise the kind of money that was necessary to make this happen. And so I've created a muffler company. Um, a few here may be familiar with it. We, it was called Super Trap Industries. We sold about a couple of hundred million dollars of product right out of a facility here in Davis. It became a $20 million business. Uh, and then eventually I sold the business when it was very dynamic and, and, and very saleable and used those proceeds along with everything else to, uh, to develop the engines that are part of the sky car. Other things that I got involved in, I formed a company called Aerobotics Inc. and we built a number of unmanned vehicles, miniature versions of what you see here and delivered them to the government, California government for bridge inspection, uh, the US military for battlefield inspection, uh, many other kinds of interesting applications. In one case, for example, we built one that would be used in a case of a nuclear attack in a, at an Air Force facility where they couldn't send people out and they could send out this unmanned vehicle uh, to survey it. This is back in the time when they didn't really have the unmanned vehicles they have today. I'm talking back in the, in the mid-90s for the most part. I developed the Davis Research Park, which you're familiar with, many of you in Davis. Uh, again, uh, created a lot of capital in the process, and you know where it all went. Um, created Freedom Motors, a company to license, develop and license this unique engine that we developed with the Skycar. There's only spin-off technologies. Clearly the muffler came from developing a muffler for the Skycar. The engine possibilities came from developing an engine for the Skycar. And that is really a very important part of our business at this time, or becoming a very important part of our business. More recently, I've been developing the Melt Farm, another real estate project. Not that I really like this idea. I mean, I, I, real estate is not where I want to be, but uh, you know, I, you, you go where the money is and wherever you can get create capital to support this, maybe hobby, some people would say, avocation rather than a vocation. Finally, this whole thing has taken a hell of a lot longer than I planned on, and I, got, I decided I better get into life extension. So I started, I started doing a lot of research in life extension um, and discovered that, there was, that almonds have unique capabilities, really remarkable uh, in, in terms of many important elements. And so I started growing organic almond butter, or really growing the almonds and creating organic almond butter, and I'm selling that nationally across the United States at the moment. Another entrepreneurial project, not of choice, but of necessity. I'm often let to, you know, when I comment about this, I, I really feel like the farmer who inherits the $2 million and now he's excited because now he can farm for another 10 years. 